Welcome to the Sunday Sermon for the 18th of April 2021. This is a sermon for Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church in West Norwood. But everyone, if you found this video, you're very, very welcome to hear God's word today. This is the 20th message in a series we've been doing on the book of Psalms. And we've arrived at Psalm 17. Psalm 17. I'm going to read this to you now from the English Standard Version. So please do turn there. If you've got a Bible or a phone or tablet or computer. And let's hear the word of God from Psalm 17. Psalm 17. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. From lips free of deceit. From your presence, let my vindication come. Let your eyes behold the right. You have tried my heart. You have visited me by night. You have tested me and you will find nothing. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. With regard to the works of man, by the word of your lips, I've avoided the ways of the violent. My lips, sorry, my steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline your ear to me. Hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O Saviour, of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me in the shadow of your wings from the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. They close their hearts to pity. With their mouths they speak arrogantly. They have now surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. He is like a lion eager to tear, as a young lion lurking in ambush. Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him. Deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. You fill their womb with treasure. They are satisfied with children and they leave their abundance to their infants. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness. When I awake, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you today to look at your word. Father, we ask you to speak to us. Lord, give us understanding. Help us to not just understand, but to apply this scripture to our lives, to our prayer lives, to our relationship with you, to the priorities that we have in our lives. Lord, how we need you. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God for his word. Now, in the United Kingdom or in England and Wales, we are just over, just under rather, a week from the opening up of shops and of outdoor hospitality. And lots of people have been very excited about being able to go out, to go shopping, to eat out, to go to pub gardens. They feel, many people, like they've missed out on life for a whole year or just over a whole year. During this past year, they've lost the things that make them feel satisfied. Even more than that, many have lost people. Many have lost routines and financial security that 
enable them to feel comfortable and confident for the future. And as a result, many people are unsettled and have little or no peace. Many people feel unsatisfied with life as it has been for the last year. Now, David's situation is different to ours, but David's experience is actually very similar in the sense that while his problems are different, the effect upon his life is the same as ours today. Now, his situation appears to be that he is falsely accused. So verse one, hear a just cause, O Lord, and that he appears to be in danger of his life. He speaks in verse nine of the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. But these things are causing David trouble. They are causing him to need to call upon the Lord. Because whatever the source of trouble, be it COVID, restrictions, or in David's case, false accusation and physical danger from enemies, whatever the source of the trouble, the effect is that we lose our peace, our security and our satisfaction. Trouble and loss and pain shake us. We feel insecure. We feel the pain of loss and disappointment, which can lead to deep discouragement, dissatisfaction and discontent. And the way David prays here is so important because the way David prays is a road out of disappointment, discouragement, dissatisfaction and discontent. He shows us in his prayer that the believer's security and satisfaction is found in the Lord alone. And that when trouble comes, we need to go to him. Now this in many ways is the prayer of the godly person of Psalm 15. You can look back in the studies in the Psalms and you can find a sermon on Psalm 15. Psalm 15 speaks as of he who walks blamelessly and does what is right and speaks truth in his heart. And the whole of the book of Psalms is this picture of the way of the righteous and the way of the wicked. And that's laid out for us in Psalm 1. It's also a, a, a promise, expectation of the coming king of Psalm 2. But while we are waiting for the coming king for us, the second coming of King Jesus, we are on this road which is marked with trouble. You cannot read the Psalms and say that to be a Christian means you have a problem-free life. The Psalms are full of trouble. And Psalm 15, we saw a couple of times ago, is that Psalm about being on the way of the righteous, what it looks like, the security of being on that way. He who does these things shall never be moved. That's Psalm 15, 5. Psalm 17 is the prayer of the person on the way of the righteous who, for whatever reason, is going through discouragement and disappointment and dissatisfaction. And Psalm 17 turned us around to focus our attention, our satisfaction on the Lord. Now, Psalm 16, which was we looked at before Easter, also has this similar theme, how David is trusting God to preserve him. And David concludes verse Psalm 16, 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. 
at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. So, and David moves from that to Psalm 17 to speak about the content of his prayer. Psalm 16 is his testimony. Psalm 17 is how he prays, what he prays for in trouble. And then Psalm 18, which we'll look at next week, is a testimony of how he looked back over his life to see God's deliverance. And after that, we will take a pause from the Psalms and go back to 1 Samuel. Anyway, enough background. Let's get into the text of this psalm now. Uh, four things I'd like you to see from this psalm. They all begin with S. The first is C. The second is shelter. The third is save. And the fourth is satisfied. So the first thing David asks the Lord to do is to see. This is in verses one to five. He appeals to the Lord to vindicate him. Look at verse two. From your presence, let my vindication come. We've already mentioned verse one. Hear a just cause. O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. This would suggest that he is being lied about. Now, we don't know the reason, but it could be referring to the time that he was fleeing from Saul and that that would fit the context because verse 9 speaks of the enemies who surround, which is exactly what Saul was doing as he was chasing David around the mountain. And indeed, Psalm 18, the title of Psalm 18, speaks of when the Lord delivered David from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. So while we don't know for certain, David fleeing from Saul, David being accused of being a rebel against Saul, and then being chased around the wilderness by Saul, would certainly fit the context of Psalm 17. But again, it's written in such a way that whatever our trouble, Psalm 17 can be our prayer. But actually, this prayer is quite disturbing to us because he seems to be suggesting that he deserves God to hear him. He's telling God he's innocent. End of verse two, let your eyes behold the right. He says to God in verse three, God, you've tested me. You've tried my heart. You've visited me by night. You've tested me and you will find nothing. He's telling God, I'm guarding my tongue. End of verse three, I've purposed that my mouth will not transgress. Verse four, with regard to the works of man, by the word of your lips, I've avoided the way to the violent. That's his behavior. Notice his grounding in a society that's opposed to God is the word of God. It says, not by my superior wisdom or strength, but by the word of your lips, I have avoided the ways of the violent. That's very important. If you are a Christian, you don't walk in holiness simply because you think it's a good idea or you're bound by some religious rule book. No, the power to live comes, yes, from the Spirit of God working in your life, but the ground of that power is the Word of God. It's by the Word of His lips that you have the strength to stand in these days and to walk faithfully. And then he says, verse 5, My steps have held fast your paths. My feet have not slipped. And that's the link with Psalm 15. Verse five, he who does these things shall never be moved or shall not slip, which is what the word is at the end of 17, Psalm 17 and verse five. He's saying, Lord, if you look into my heart, you won't find wrong. He's saying, I have sought to guard my tongue. I'm guarding my behavior and I'm walking on the way of the righteous according to your word. Now he's not saying that he's sinless and that's important. 
We know he's not sinless because you've got psalms like Psalm 51 and Psalm 32, where David confesses his sins. And indeed, in Psalm 6, which we looked at a few months ago, it says, O Lord, rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. What he's saying here in the first five verses of Psalm 17 is not that I'm sinless, but that I'm innocent of the charges laid against me. Again, we saw this in Psalm 7. O Lord, my God, if I have done this, if there's been any wrong in my hands, if, he's saying, I've done this, that's Psalm 7 and verse 3. So David has already spoken of being falsely accused. And I was coming back to that and saying, Lord, you know that the things that they're saying about me are not true. Now, we are not sinless, but we can talk to the Lord about our desire to seek after him. We can tell him about how we're praying, how we're turning away from sin. We can talk to him about those things and also tell him how the troubles we're facing often make it harder for us to walk faithfully with him. It's not boasting about righteousness, it's simply being honest with the Lord about the nature of our walk with him and what is going on in our lives. But I do find these verses a huge challenge because I don't think I can pray like David does. I don't think I can say, Lord, you've tried my heart, visited me by night and you've tested me and you found nothing. Because we know our own hearts. It's a huge challenge to say, can I really, really pray like that? You know, there's only one person who can truly pray like that. And that was the Lord Jesus Christ. who was sinless, our sinless saviour. And for us, prayer is all of grace, all of grace. We don't deserve answers to prayer in and of ourselves. That's why the image of prayer in the book of Revelation is a prayers of the saints mixed with incense ascending to the throne of God. Our prayers come through the Saviour, through the one who truly fulfilled this psalm, through the one who faced the enemies all around him, the one who was satisfied in his Lord and, and, and not in the things that the world would give, the one who slept as it were in death and then rose from the dead and he awoke and beholds now for all eternity the face of his father as he sits at his right hand. He is the fulfillment of this psalm and he is the one through whom we can pray. So David says, Verse two, let your eyes behold the right. And we can say, Lord, yet your eyes behold the righteousness of your son, the Lord Jesus, our saviour, our intercessor, the one who went before us, the one who died in our place. So it's all of grace. But at the same time, I believe these verses are a challenge to our walk with God. In Psalm 66, Psalm 66 and verse 18. Psalm 66 and verse 18 says, If I had cherished iniquity in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. David is saying, he's not saying I'm perfect. None of us can say that. But he's saying that there's nothing in my heart I'm holding on to, that I'm trying to hide from you, trying to pretend that I'm walking on the way of the righteous when really I'm not. And the challenge to us is, can we pray in that way? Can we say, Lord, look into my heart and you will see that I'm truly following you? that there are no secret sins that I'm trying to hide 
from your sight. That our prayer life must be keeping short accounts with him. So we go to him in prayer, rather than pretending that all is well, we bring to him our sin. We say, Lord, I, I, I'm really strong. I've, I've lost my temper today. Lord, I've looked at uh, uh, someone of the opposite sex in the wrong way today. Lord, I've, st I've watched a movie I shouldn't have watched. Lord, I've built my assurance upon things and not on you. You confess your sins. Lord, I've gossiped about my colleague. You bring, you hide those things. You keep short accounts. And suddenly when we don't do that, we come into his presence and we feel unsettled and we need to stop and bring our requests to him, bring our, our confession rather to him and tell him about our sin. Last uh, Sunday service, we had a, a prayer of confession. That's a good thing to do each day, not necessarily the set words, but a confession from your heart, Lord I've sinned, cleanse me. So then you can say, now, now those sins are, are covered. Now you've, as it were, restored that relationship with him, that experience of that relationship with him. Your sins are paid for already, but they affect our relationship. And you brought them to him and they're, they're, they're washed. He's, he's fulfilled his promise of, of, of 1 John 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And we come in that confession of sin. And then we approach the throne of grace boldly, knowing that we are forgiven. So let's be a people who come with clean hands and a pure heart to him in prayer. So he says, see my heart. Secondly, he prays for shelter. That's picked up at verse six. There's much in this psalm about prayer and different words for prayer, which there isn't time to look at today, but we will look at in Tuesday's Bible study. But here David shows confidence. Verse six, I call upon you for you will answer me. He has an assurance that God hears his prayer. That is so important. We don't pray to the ceiling. We pray to the living God who hears. He's bold in the way he approaches. Incline your ear, he says. Again, verse six, hear my words. Now, this might sound disrespectful, but in many ways, he's simply affirming his confidence in the living God who he is present. It's good for us to affirm our confidence in him. He also appeals to God's covenant. Verse seven, wondrously show your steadfast love. He's asking for the covenant love and care of God to be manifested, for a fresh assurance of that love that he sees displayed in the scriptures. We have seen the ultimate demonstration of the love of God in the cross, his covenant love. This is how we come to him now. This is how, if you're a Christian, you can pray because you come through Christ according to his covenant love. And we need to keep looking at what he's done. That is a foundation of our prayer. That's the basis of our confidence. He has wondrously shown his steadfast love in the cross. And when we're back to being regularly celebrating the Lord's Supper as a means by which this, the, the sign points us to the covenant love of God shown in the cross. Notice also that this is a prayer of through, as it were, in community. The end of verse seven, O saviour of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. David is aligning himself with all God seekers, all those who are in trouble. And this is really important. We might pray for our troubles and our troubles may be very great to us. 
but we are part of a worldwide community and there are people today whose trouble is even greater than yours who have suffered almost all their lives for being a Christian who have lost loved ones due to persecution who've been in prison and when we pray for trouble Let's not simply become so me focused that my trouble is so huge. That's all we talk about. But actually we recognize that we're part of the community of others in our local church, but others the world over who are the seeker, the seeker of refuge from the Savior. And then he asks specifically for the Lord's care. Verse eight, keep me as the apple of your eye, the apple of your eye. Our eyes are precious and we guard them. So David is saying, I need you to treat me like that. It's a word picture. God hasn't literally got eyes, but be assured if someone tries to poke you in the eye, you shut your eye, you put your hand up, you turn away, you guard your eyes and and David is saying God be treat me like that it says in Psalm 30 sorry not Psalm Deuteronomy Deuteronomy 32 and verse 10 he that is the Lord found Israel in a desert land in the howling weight of the wilderness he encircled him he cared for him he kept him as the apple of his eye he will guard he will keep you are precious to him he cares for you even though it's hard today receive that encouragement second half of verse 8 says hide me or shelter me in the shadow of your wings again we see this in the Scripture, God being the shelter, the protector of his people. So Psalm 121 and verse 5, the Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. And indeed the appeal of the Lord Jesus to those who, uh, the appeal of the Lord Jesus to those who, surrounded him on his journey to Jerusalem Luke 13 verse 34 oh Jerusalem Jerusalem the city that kills the prophets and stoned those who were sent to it how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you were not willing but he shelters and cares for and protects his people and notice this is not just protection but this is intimacy he the hen the, the bird gathers her chicks into her and so the father covers us he covers us indeed from our sin when we come through Jesus Christ that's the problem with not being saved if you don't let Jesus cover you then you're lost and you need to be saved. You need to put your trust in him, the one who died on the cross, who died in your place and who covers your sins. You need him. So there's that covering and protection, but there's also that drawing near to the warmth and intimacy of the care of the mother bird. Yes, God the Father, but here there's motherly image of intimate and precious care and he will not allow anything to touch you outside of his purposes and notice here while David is praying for protection and vindication the heart of his prayer is not these external things but his relationship with God hide me or shelter me is not only a prayer for protection but an expression of desire to draw near to God and drawing near to him is our strength in trouble our comfort in sorrow and our satisfaction in loss and suffering it is right to pray for things 
But if our prayers are just for things, then we are missing the point of this psalm and we're missing the point of prayer. Prayer is to draw near to God through Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, through the way that he has made. It's to call upon him for a greater sense of enjoyment and delight in him. So see, shelter and save. And this is a much shorter point, I'm sure you'll be pleased to know. He starts in verse 10 with a description of the enemies. He refers to them in verse 9, the wicked who do me violence, my deadly enemies who surround me. Then he says they close their hearts to pity. Literally, they are fat and hardened. Vivid language of those satisfied and contented in themselves and have no heart for anyone else, just simply to get rid of those that oppose them. And again, this is a reminder to us that we can tell God what is going on. Verse 11, they surrounded our steps. They set their eyes to cast us to the ground. Then this image, he's like a lion eager to tear, lying in ambush. And then he actually, having described, he then asks. And we have three short phrases. Arise, O Lord, confront him, subdue him, deliver, and then fourthly, deliver my soul from the wicked by your sword. The sword is a symbol of judgment. So he's saying, Lord, rescue me, intervene, break in, stop him. Now, again, we've we've said that there are some Verses in the Psalms that are really quite hard to pray after the cross. And I will, when we get to a Psalm which is full of these kind of prayers for judgment, I will deal with that issue in more detail. But just notice this, David does not say, I'm going to deal with them. He says, Lord, you deal with them. And going back to that Point in verse 7, O saviour of those who seek refuge from their adversaries at your right hand. Identifying ourselves as part of community. It is absolutely right, as we've said before, to pray not only for the protection of those who attack God's people, but if they will not repent for their removal. Bring them to the Lord and put them into his hand. Put even those who oppose you into the Lord's hands. Verse 14, from men by your hand, O Lord, from men of the world whose portion is in this life. So he's saying the problem with these people is they're satisfied with this life. He goes on, you fill their womb or their belly with treasure. They're satisfied with children and they leave their abundance to their infant. This is them saying, look, Lord, these people are satisfied with the things of this world. You give them all these things and they don't even recognise you. And they're satisfied with them themselves. This is a great challenge to us too. Are we? As Christians living in a world that cries for satisfaction in things, are we satisfied in the Lord or are we seeking satisfaction in full tummies, in nice families, in successful children and grandchildren? It's so easy to get caught up with these things. And of course, we want to be safe. We want our physical needs met. We want blessing upon the next generation of children or nephews or nieces if we haven't got our own children. We want these things, but these things are not the ultimate. And this is how David ends. He says, instead of that way of satisfaction, he says, verse 15, as for me. So yes, see, shelter, save, but above all, I want to be satisfied. And I will be satisfied in you. 
Psalm 16 we mentioned already. Verse 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And a little bit earlier, Psalm 11, verse 7, the Lord is righteous. He loves righteous deeds. The upright shall behold his face. Whatever's going on in David's life, he's ending with this glorious conclusion that I will behold your face. I will see your faith. This is the promise of the word of God. This is the assurance that we have if we are believers. Revelation 22 and verse 4, they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. They will see his face. That is the destination and that is the source of satisfaction. It says, when I awake, that's a waking after death. When I awake, I shall be satisfied. I shall be fulfilled. I shall have so much that there will not be any need of anything else. I shall have sufficiency in you with your likeness. It's very interesting, this word likeness, you find it in the Ten Commandments. So in Exodus chapter 20, where we have God's commandments given. And the second commandment is you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness. That's the same word of anything that is in heaven above. That means including the likeness of God. Why? Because you cannot have any picture or any statue that can even, or any imagination actually, that can even begin to describe completely the awesome majesty and glory of the living God. And yet David is saying, on that day, I shall be satisfied with your likeness. I won't need the image because I will see you face to face. The goal of prayer is to seek him now, to seek to know him more, but that we would long to journey through this way of the righteous, whatever troubles are thrown at us, that we would behold his face. Brothers and sisters, let's use this prayer. I will say more about some of the words he uses for prayer on Tuesday at the Bible study. But even if you can't get to that or watch that, there's an, so much already that we've seen that I hope will help you. Firstly, ask the Lord to search you. Ask him to see. Ask him to visit you at night. Ask him to look into your heart. Ask him to examine your speech. Ask him to examine your behaviour. And where he puts his finger, ask him to take it away, to wash you, that he would look into your heart and find no evil, because he's so working in you. And every sin you deal with swiftly, quickly, by taking it to him. Let your prayers be full of him, not just for the things he gives you, but for him himself. Revel in your preciousness to him, the apple of his eye, his protection. Say, Lord, shelter me, hide me. Let me know your presence with me. That's more important than things being safe and secure in a material, physical sense. I want you, O oh Lord. And take assurance that at no point will he reject you. Any more than as it were, if he could take his eye out. This is an image. He hasn't got a physical eye. It's a, it's a picture. Any more than he would let his eye be touched. He will surely also defend and protect you. And guard you. And shelter you. He will not turn you away. If you've come to him through Jesus Christ 
your righteousness. And finally, press on to the final destination. Don't be satisfied even with the good things the Lord gives you in this life. Because these things fill our tummies, but not our souls. They help us emotionally and mentally and encourage us along the way, but they're not him. They're not him as good as things and people are. They are not him. He is enough. He is all sufficient. And he will show us his full, full sufficiency on that final day. Let's be satisfied with him now and forever. Let's pray. Father, help us with these things. Lord, there are many things that have caused us discouragement and discontent and dissatisfaction. But Father, you are enough. Help us to call upon you and help us to press on until that great day. To you be the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you in abundance. Thank you for listening.